And I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11. On coming to house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down, they worshipped him. They opened their treasures, presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. Powerful, powerful passage in scripture, one that I know you've heard of many times in your Christian journey, but we're going to talk about those wise men today and hopefully extract some powerful lessons from their life and from their example that we can apply. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this Christmas season. I want to thank you, Lord, for the privilege we had over the last few weeks just to be celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ and what that means to each one of us. I want to thank you, Lord, for the wise men who came to worship the Lord. And I pray that as we get ready to enter 2024, God, that that would be our heart and our desire to worship you as King of kings and Lord of lords. We praise you and thank you for this day. And in Jesus' precious name, amen. We're a little short on musicians today, but I'm thankful for those that are behind me ready to lead us in worship. Let's all stand together, please, and maybe greet somebody. You can just wave or knuckle bump or whatever and welcome people here. We'll start singing in a minute. Hello. Hello. There I am. You gotta do that again, right? <laughs> Greatest day in your story. Death to speak and you have rescued me. Sing it out. Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive, he's alive, and oh, happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed When I stand in that place Free at last, meeting face to face I am yours, Jesus, you are mine Endless choice and perfect peace Earthly pain finally will see Celebrate, Jesus is alive He's alive, and oh, happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, forever I am changed, and oh, Wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, oh, happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, oh, 
happy day, happy day. You washed my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. Woo, good morning, Grace Church. How y'all doing? I was thinking, um, you know, what Pastor was saying, and actually kind of what, what's, what brought that song up uh, this morning was, um, was that, you know, we just celebrated his birth, right? And so we know that coming up next is going to be what? We're going to be celebrating his life and his resurrection and, uh, you know, his, his death on the cross and whatever. Um, we can sing that song for his birth. We can sing that song for his life. We can sing that song for his death, burial, and resurrection as well. Amen? Amen. All right. Y'all doing well? You happy for the new year? Yeah? <laughs> no. <laughs> ah, got it. All right. Gonna have a drink. Sorry. Well, love to see all your bright, smiling faces this morning. And we'll go on. With his heart open wide From the depths, from the heights I will bring the sacrifice With these hands lifted high Hear my song, hear my cry I will bring a sacrifice I will bring a sacrifice Take his life and let it shine. Take his life and let it shine. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. Oh, and all my heart, this much is true. joy to say your will your way it will be my joy to say your will your way it will be my joy to say your will your way always it will be my joy to say your will be my joy, say your will, your way it will be my joy, say your will, your way, always. I lay me down, I'm not my own, I belong to you alone. Lay Oh, and all my heart, this much 
is true. There's no life apart from you. Lay me down, lay me down. Lay me down, lay me down. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for everybody here today, and I just thank you for the fact that even though we're down a few people, we can still just worship you, Lord, because it's not about who's up here on stage. It's about our voices being lifted up to you, and I just pray that we would remember that. Um, I pray that you would just bless us all as we move into the new year, and that we would focus on you as we do so, and in your name we pray, amen. 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 Thanks, sis. You can stand, you can sit, however you feel today. thousand times I feel still your mercy remains should I stumble again still I'm caught in your grace everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all things my heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out. remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame my heart and my soul i give you control Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out, Lord, my soul cries out everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all things. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside. 
my soul I give you control Consume me from the inside out, Lord Let justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the inside out Everlasting Your light will shine when all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond all fame And the cry of my heart Is to bring you praise from the inside Cries out everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out, Lord, my soul. Cries out from the inside out. Cries out from the inside out, Lord, my soul cries out. Amen. It's awfully quiet in here. <laughs> Are you awake out there? I can hear you singing. Are you just waking up just for the songs? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The battle rages on A storm and tempest roar We cannot win this fight Inside our rebel hearts We're laying down our weapons now We raise our white flag We surrender Here on this holy ground, you made a way for peace. Laying your body down, you took our rightful place. This freedom song is marching on. We raise our white flag. We surrender all to you and all for you. We raise our white flag. The war is over. Love has come. Your love has won. We lift the cross, lift it high, lift it high. We lift. The cross lift it I lift it I we lift the cross lift it I lift it I we lift the cross lift it I lift it I we lift the cross lift it I lift it I we lift the cross lift it I lift it I we lift the cross lift it I lift it I we lift the cross, lift it I lift it I We raise our white flag, we surrender all to you and all for you. We raise our white flag, the war is over, love has come, your love has won. We raise our white flag. We 
surrender all to you and all for you. We raise our white flag. The war is over. Love has come. Your love has won. We lift the cross. Lift it I Lift it I We lift the cross. Lift it I Lift it I We lift. The cross lifted I lifted I we lift the cross lifted I lifted I Amen. Well thank you, worship team, appreciate your service of the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this precious day to, to come and, and to worship you for the last day of 2023. God, you have been so good to us throughout this year, and even though many of us have had different challenges and trials, but God, you are always good and always faithful and always provide, and we're so grateful to you for giving us such a, a wonderful year. And we look forward to 2024, and I pray, God, that every moment of that year will be used for your glory and your honor. And thank you, Lord, for the privilege to study the Word this morning. And God, while it's on my mind and on my heart, I want to pray for Mary Ann Eckhart and pray for her shoulder to heal. And uh, we think of Louise and Jan, who are homesick today. I know there's probably others that I'm not aware of. And I want to pray for Christabel Budak, who used to come here and who has had a stroke. And we pray, God, for, for Christabel and for her healing, and that you would just uh, strengthen her body. And I pray for Tony and his family as they are there with Christabel, ministering to her, and just watch over her, God, in a special way this day. And in Jesus' precious name, amen. We'll let the kids go to the edge, okay? Through fifth, we'll dismiss you, and you have a good time. And listen well to Miss Gloria as she teaches you. And um, <clears throat> some have chosen to go out the side door. Cheryl, can you grab that door there? That's no problem. And then, uh, well, we're going to wrap up today our, our, our Christmas series. And I know it's not Christmas time, but uh, <clears throat> the story I'm going to talk to you today didn't happen at Christmas time. It happened a couple years later. So uh, we're going to talk about the wise men today. But. But I am, one thing I really enjoy about Christmas is I love to see the little grandbabies get gifts. Isn't that exciting? Uh, we had all our little grandkids all sitting on the living room floor and just waiting for the gifts, and they got their little gifts, and they started opening them. And it's just exciting to see the smiles on their face and the, as the expression of love to them. They receive the gift, they open it up, and they enjoy it, and and it was just an exciting time. <clears throat> well, I, I was reading about some guy who, uh, about a week before Christmas, thought he would go buy his wife a little gift. Always a wise thing, guys, to don't forget. Don't forget your wife on Christmas Day, right? Uh, make sure you get her. You make hope you got her a gift of some type, like an ironing board or or something like that, right? But, uh, anyways. Uh, <clears throat> Tom was going to go get his wife a really nice gift for Christmas, and, and uh, he was looking at the, at the cosmetic desk there, and he, he saw some perfume there, and he goes, how about some perfume? And the clerk said, sure. And she reached out, she grabbed a bottle, it cost about 50 bucks. Tom said, well, that's just a little bit too much. Um, so she returned with a smaller bottle, and it was only about $30. And Tom said, that's still a little bit too much. Uh, finally, uh, the clerk brought him a little bottle that was only $15. Certainly, Tom could afford 15 bucks, right, for his wife. And Tom grew a little agitated, and he says, what I mean is I'd, I'd really like to see something really, really cheap. So the clerk came back in a few moments, and she had a mirror that she handed to Tom. <laughs> All Tom had to do is look in that mirror, right? Amen? <clears throat> you know, it's been interesting to me over the years to see that certain gifts are really popular. 
I don't know if you remember those that were alive in 1975. You may remember the Sony Betamax. The Sony Betamax recorded TV programs and it only cost 2,300 bucks. Now you can do it just on your, with a Euro control, your TV control, and you can record any channel you want to, right? Another popular gift that year was a mood ring. You remember the mood ring? How many of you ever had a mood ring? All right, many of you have had mood rings, and you know, it changed colors depending on what kind of mood you were in. Now, I don't remember all the colors and all the different moods, but there was the purple mood, or purple color. That was if you were happy. There was the blue color if you were discouraged and down in the dumps, and there's other colors that represented different moods that a person had. Very popular gift in 1975. This one I don't understand. This, is, this one was called the Pet Rock. You remember the Pet Rock? Like, why would anybody want to buy a rock? I don't know, but anyways, it, changed, it, it didn't change colors. This one here, uh, this one sold 1.3 million. 1.3 million pet rocks were sold in 1975. And, and all it is, it, it came with a little box. It had a little bed with some straw in it that the rock could be in, right? Like that rock really knows there's a bed there, right? But anyways, um, and it was an instant sensation. I mean, people were, were lining up to buy a pet rock. And if you have a pet rock, okay, well... And then a few years later, 1983, there was the Cabbage Patch Kid Dolls. Long, long line, if you're a parent at that time, you know how it is, long lines, and, and people were just fighting, trying to get a Cabbage Patch uh, doll just for their kid. And, and I mean, it was almost impossible to get. I think they came with a little birth certificate, supposedly, when they were made and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> One thing that all these items have in common, they're no longer popular. Um, anyone that has any of these gifts, they're probably stuffed away in a box. Maybe they, maybe they took them to Goodwill or threw them in a waste can or whatever, or they're in the attic or some barn, or maybe they gave them away to somebody else, regifted them, you know, the gift that keeps giving, uh, that kind of idea. You know, gifts kind of lose their luster over a period of time. But I want you to know that Jesus Christ is the greatest gift of all, and he was given by the Heavenly Father to a lost and dying world, John 3, 16. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 9, 15, in your notes there, it says, Now thanks be to God for His indescribable gift, which is precious beyond words. Another translation reads this way, Thank God for His gift, too wonderful for words. Folks, I want you to know that that is how Joseph and Mary felt about Jesus. He was more than their, more than a little baby, but he, they knew that he is God. God the Son, the Savior of the world, the Messiah. And they knew that <clears throat> to try to describe the wonder of this little child, is, he's just too wonderful for words. That's how they felt, and that's how the shepherds felt. They were overjoyed to come and see Jesus wrapped in those cloths, lying there in a manger in a feeding trough. A couple years later, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus received a surprise visit from some wise men from the east. And those wise men felt the same way about Jesus Christ. They traveled a thousand miles to express their love and their worship by giving special gifts to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I want to leave this one thought with you. <clears throat> if you get nothing else from the whole lesson, get this. As we enter 2024... I want to challenge you to give to Jesus and worship him. Give to Jesus and worship him. And I'm not talking, I'm not necessarily talking monetarily wise. I'm talking give him your life, every aspect of it. Give it all to Jesus Christ and worship him. Let's pray. Father, as we dig into the word this morning, please, please uh, speak to our hearts, God, as only you can do. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You take a notes this morning. Notice, first of all, there was a variety of responses concerning Jesus Christ. And I, you know what's interesting to me is the Word of God is so relevant. Every book, every chapter, every verse is relevant uh, today as it was back when it was originally uh, written and inspired. And so uh, what we have here today is, is totally 
uh, in line and, and relevant for the very day that we live, which is today. It says there is, there's a variety of responses concerning Christ. And I want you to notice, first of all, the wise men, the reason they came was to adore him, to adore Jesus. And they didn't mind traveling many miles. Uh, that was not uh, a concern to them. Look at verse 1 there of Matthew chapter 2. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Uh, in, in particular, in that verse, notice the timing of their visit. It was after the birth of Jesus Christ, after he was born in Bethlehem. You know, a lot of times, and this is not to be critical, but a lot of times we'll see uh, manger scenes, maybe on a on a Christmas card, and it has Joseph and Mary and Jesus in, the, in a stable along with some shepherds. And then there's some wise men standing off to the right with their gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they're all there at the same time. But the event that is recorded here in Matthew chapter 2 occurred up to a couple years later after the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. And by this time, Jesus was no longer a baby as he was in Luke chapter 2 and verse 12. Now he is called a child in Matthew 2, 9 and also in verse 11. He is now a toddler who is living in Bethlehem with Joseph and Mary. The family of Jesus was no longer huddled around a manger, around a feeding trough uh, located in possibly a cave. Now they're living in a house, according to Matthew 2, 11, and they're in Bethlehem. And as we mentioned last week, Bethlehem was known for centuries as Ephrathah, which is mentioned in Micah 5, 2, and it means fruitfulness. But that name was changed to Bethlehem, which means house of bread, uh, during the time of Joshua's conquest of Canaan. So at the time of the birth of Christ, Bethlehem was called the city of David. So the timing of the wise men's visit was after the Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and notice next, it was during the time of King Herod. I'll give you a little background on King Herod. Uh, Julius Caesar appointed Herod's father. Uh, his name is pronounced Anta, Antipater to be governor of Judea uh, under Roman rule. Well, Antipater appointed Herod. Uh, to be the prefect of the region of Galilee. Uh, so Herod fled, we know from history, that he fled to Egypt when the Parthians invaded Palestine. Uh, he eventually traveled to Rome in 40 B.C. He was declared the king of the Jews by Octavian and by Antony. He returned the next year to, to the region of Israel, or to Jerusalem area. He drove out the Parthians after a few years of fighting, and finally established his kingdom. Now, something wrong with his genealogy. You know, Abraham's promised son was Isaac. We know from Scripture that Isaac had two sons. The oldest was Esau. The youngest was Jacob. We know that Jacob had 12 sons and one daughter, and Jacob's 12 sons each headed up a tribe of Israel. Uh, the royal tribe was from the tribe of Judah, from which Jesus Christ uh, descended from his human side, Esau's descendants were Edomites. Herod the Great was an Edomite. He was a descendant of Esau. He was not from the line of Judah, nor was he a descendant of David. He was not the rightful king of the Jews, though he was appointed by man to be uh, the king of the Jews. He was not the rightful king of the Jews. And the Jews viewed him that way, and they, they didn't like, they actually hated uh, Herod and never fully recognized him as a king. And since Herod wasn't a full-blooded Jew, he would do everything he could to try to appease the Jews and to try to, to get them on his side, and so he married a Jew, a Jewish woman. He also tried to win their favor by giving some tax money to the people, uh, giving them food when they were hungry, building some theaters for entertainment and racetracks and other entertain entertainment-type structures. Even, even started to rebuild the Temple of Jerusalem in 19 B.C. All these things trying to, to win friends, trying to win them over. 
But folks, I want you to know that all this was a mere show. He was a vile man. He was evil. He was a murderer. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the time of King Herod, notice the next portion of verse 1, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. What a time to enter Jerusalem when you got this tyrant who is, who is in the area and being viewed as the king of the Jews. And uh, here you come to worship the true king of the Jews. Magi, we know them as, it's where you get the English word magic or magician. Now, traditionally, we believe, some believe that there were three wise men that entered Jerusalem. Others believe there were three groups of people that entered Jerusalem. The Magi, the soldiers that traveled with them, uh, all their servants. It was a big entourage that entered into Jerusalem. And the truth is, we don't know how many of the Magis there were, how many of the wise men actually entered into Jerusalem to worship the Lord. And as stated in the text, the wise men were from the east. It can be translated from the rising of the sun or from the orient. Now, if they were from Parthia, which would be northeast of Babylon, here's a little map up here on the screen. I dropped my pointer, so I'll just point right up here. If they lived around this area here, that means their journey was coming all the way. Here's Babylon here. That means they had a quite a long journey to finally end up in Jerusalem, probably about a thousand miles one way. So that's quite a long trip uh, for these guys to travel. And uh, according to scholars, the wise men that came all the way from possibly Parthia were, were very knowledgeable, men, of, men that knew astronomy and, and science and agriculture and math and history. Uh, they excelled in the area of religion. In the political arena, often the kings would go to the wise men and ask them for their input and for their advice on governing issues and laws. So these wise men were Gentiles. Uh, and, so, and they knew about the one true God. Possibly they learned it from Daniel, who was in captivity in Babylon for about 70 years. And uh, Maybe they learned it from some other Jews that, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and other, other godly Jewish people who were firm in their faith. These wise men, along with their big entourage, certainly grabbed the attention of King Herod and the people living there in Jerusalem. And so understand that these wise men traveled many miles. Not only that, their search for Jesus was meticulous. Verse 2, and, and ask, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. The word ask there is a present participle indicating that these guys were continually asking all the people there in Jerusalem where the king of the Jews was located. You can hear the buzz going around. And I mean, hey, do you know where the king of the Jews is at? Do you know where the king of the Jews is at? Uh, where is he located? And, and that news, I guarantee, got back to King Herod. So picture the wise men all the way throughout the city questioning different individuals. They did all this public research under the careful watch of a murderer known as Herod. Notice in verse 2, they weren't looking for the child who would be king one day. Understand these words here. They're worded by the Holy Spirit the way they should be. Uh, they were looking for Jesus who was born king of the Jews. Jesus was king before his birth because he is the eternal God. Amen. He has always been king and always will be king. He was born king of the Jews. He was king before his birth, king at his birth. He is king at age two. He is king now. He'll be king for all eternity. Amen? The big question we have here today is this. Is he king of your life? If you're getting ready to go into 2024, is Jesus Christ the king of your life? Or are you trying to call the shots? Are you the one that wants to be your own king? Sit on your own throne, have your own scepter, and, and call and, and make your own decisions and leave God out of it? Or is Jesus Christ the king of your life? 
I'll leave you to think about that little question. You ponder on that as we go through the rest of this lesson. These guys traveled many miles. These wise men, I mean, their search for Jesus was meticulous. And not only that, their purpose was to worship the master. They came to worship Jesus. And they, made, they were not afraid to articulate their purpose for that trip. Look at verse 2 again. We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. They were not ashamed. They didn't cower back. They wanted everybody to know why they were there in the city of Jerusalem searching for Jesus Christ, the King. We want to worship him. They followed that star. I always talk about this every year, but the star could have been a heavenly body of some type. Could have been an actual star. I believe God, if God wanted to say, all right, star, I want you to move. You're going to move now. You'll come back to your position later, but I want you to move, and you just kind of guide these guys God's own GPS system, amen? You guide these guys to where, uh, where Jesus is at and, and then go back to your place, all right? God could have done that. God could have created a star special for this very moment to guide these guys to where they needed to be. Somehow, God used a star to guide those wise men to the very place where he wanted them to be so that they, their, their purpose for this trip could be fulfilled. That is to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did they see his star, but they also stated that purpose for their trip. They didn't make the trip just for the sake of seeing the beautiful countryside or, or just to get away from the, or, the ordinary routine of life. And I, I welcome, everybody should have those moments when you have a little break, take a little vacation, have some time off, and that's good. Their purpose was to worship Jesus. And I want you to know, this was exciting to them. They were, they were elated. They were happy and joyful to be able to come and worship the Lord. They had energy. It energized them. They had their sights set on Jesus Christ. Under, you ought to circle the word worship here. I love the definition of this word. It means to falling down or prostrating oneself and kissing the feet and hem of the garment of the one that is being honored. Years ago, Cheryl and I had a little dog. We called him Buddy. Buddy was a Yorkshire Terrier. And every time Buddy would come and get close to you and you'd reach your hand out like that to Buddy, he would get down just like this. He'd get real low like that, his head down to the ground. Pretty soon he'd roll on his, I won't roll on my back, right? You guys, <laughs> you guys might never come back again thinking I'm a strange nutcase, but he would roll on his back and you'd rub his little tummy and then pretty soon he'd be licking your hand and, and it, he loved to have his tummy rubbed, okay? And that little dog just, I mean, he just showed his love to you openly. There was no holding back whatsoever. And I think when I think of the word worship, that's what I think of when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. No holding back. Approaching God with humility, with honest and genuine love in your heart and just letting it flow to the Lord. God, I love you so much. Thank you so much, Jesus, for all that you've done for me. And just worshiping the Lord. I want you to notice here in this text, they didn't come to worship Mary. They didn't come to worship some celebrity there in Jerusalem who had his latest album out for everybody to listen to. They came there to worship Jesus. Jesus is God, not Mary. Jesus is the Savior, not Mary. Matter of fact, Mary rejoiced in God, her Savior, Luke 1.46. Jesus is worthy of all the worship. Every one of us in this room, those that are watching online, those out in the lobby, Jesus is worthy of all the worship that we could give him in a million lifetimes and so much more. I want you to know these wise men traveled many miles, leaving their home, their comfort, their responsibilities, investing financially, risking their own lives just to bow in reverence and adoration to Jesus. 
Here's another question for you. It's examination time. Do you look forward to spending time with Jesus? Or do you look for reasons why you don't have time for Jesus? You know, that's a question that only you and God can answer. You have to do some self-examination. God, what is, what is my true heart's desire? Here's another attitude displayed in regards to Jesus. The wise men came to adore him, but notice King Herod planned to attack Jesus. Verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When Herod heard that there were people, these wise men going around asking, where is the king of the Jews? That, that irritated him. He was agitated. Why would he be so disturbed? Well, first of all, if these guys were from Parthia, uh, and they traveled with a group of soldiers and servants, I mean, he had, a, he had a battle with the Parthians at an earlier time and drove them out of the area, and here they are back in his area. I mean, that would disturb him. But he viewed everybody as a threat to his throne. And even more threatening uh, than this group from Parthia was possibly just the thought of another king close by his throne. And even though he was married to a Jewish woman, he felt his position as king was, was threatened. And Herod had a reputation he was known for eliminating all rivals to his throne. He was a power-hungry, bloodthirsty tyrant. He was guilty of murdering his own brother-in-law, who happened to be the high priest. His name was Aristobulus. And he was guilty of drowning his own brother-in-law. And then, to make it go over better, he planned a funeral and acted like he was grieving over it. This guy was a nut job, okay? Not only that, he killed, he killed his Jewish wife, killed her, killed her mom, and his two sons. Five days before he died, a year after the birth of Jesus, he executed his third and only son, final son. He had all prominent citizens in Jerusalem thrown in jail and then gave the orders that on the day of his death to execute them. That way somebody would mourn on the day of his death. He's the same king who put out a kill order on all Jewish boys two years, and two years old and younger in Matthew 2 and verse 16. And of course, that was an attempt to eliminate Jesus, the true king, so we can understand why the people here in Jerusalem were very concerned when they heard that Herod was disturbed. So we have a guy who is extremely mentally off and mentally disturbed and, and a, 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 a bloodthirsty person who is disturbed and, of course, they're concerned for their own life. So we see another attitude represented here. Let us see. The religious leaders were apathetic towards Jesus. So the wise men, they adored him. Herod planned to attack Christ. The, the religious leaders, they were apathetic towards Jesus. Herod called a special meeting with the religious leaders. Look at verse 4. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. So he had been asking. It's not just a one-time request, though. He had been asking and trying to figure out where Christ was, was born. Matthew 2, 5, the leaders, the religious leaders said, in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. They quoted to this king, Micah, 5 and verse 2. They knew exactly where Jesus Christ uh, would be born in Bethlehem. These so-called spiritual leaders knew the prophecy of Micah, but they were not interested themselves in going to worship him. So these variety of attitudes displayed towards Jesus are the same attitudes that are displayed towards Christ today. Some people love him and worship him. Some people are very antagonistic when you mention the name Jesus. And they are, they, they, are, they are devout enemies of the cross and of Christ. 
And then there are those who are just apathetic, they're indifferent, they don't care. There's also a various actions towards regarding Jesus. Look at letter A, the Jewish leaders bypass the opportunity to worship Jesus. I mean, if you're apathetic and indifferent, why would you even take one step to go towards Bethlehem, only six or seven miles from Jerusalem? Why bother? They just bypassed it. It revealed something in their heart, okay? These high, the high priests, the scribes, didn't set, a time, didn't set aside their time. They didn't give any effort, any attention, or give Jesus Christ the worship he was worthy of. As a matter of fact, later on, it was the religious leaders who conspired against Jesus, falsely accused him, had him arrested, and, and put him on trial, stirred up the crowd to yell, crucify him, and they stood there giving their approval as Jesus was brutally murdered and slaughtered upon a cross. They did not believe in Jesus, and their unbelief was revealed by their indifferent attitudes and actions displayed towards Jesus Christ. King Herod, all he did, he bolstered his plan to eliminate Jesus. Herod called the Magi secretly, found out the exact time the star had appeared. He already knew where Jesus was located. Now he just wanted to know the exact time the star appeared. He is sizing up the age of the child, and soon he's going to make the attack. Verse 8. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. That statement, report to me so I can go and worship him, was nothing but a bold-faced lie. These wise men were deceived by the king. They thought he actually wanted to worship Jesus, but God knew the heart, right? God knows the heart. We can deceive people all we want to. We can come and we can sing. We can worship. We can carry a Bible. We can memorize scripture. We can make it look good. But God knows the heart. Amen? He does. And God, no one can pull the wool over God's eyes. He knew exactly what was going on with King Herod. Let her see the wise men bowed in worship of Jesus. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. The star that had, they'd seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And I mean, you talk about joy. We're not just talking like, yay. We're talking about, yeah! Like, like I, some of these ball games, I'm watching people with... It, we saw one the other, the other day. It was Iowa State. I think they played Kansas. And I mean, the snow is falling down. It's heavy. I mean, we're talking thick snow. And they're sitting out there with their coats on. They got snow banks on top of their heads, you know, and they're cheering, screaming, yelling, smiling. They're happy for their team. These guys were overjoyed about something that really mattered. Amen? Not that Iowa State doesn't matter, okay? Please forgive me. But these guys were overjoyed about, about someone who truly mattered. And, and the original text is piled up with all kinds of superlatives to emphasize the extent of their joy. Jumping, out and, jumping up and down, I mean, worshiping Jesus Christ was not a duty or a drudgery. It was truly a delight in their heart. They were overjoyed and thrilled beyond thrilled to be there where Jesus was at and to worship him. Unlike Herod, the wise men weren't concerned about promoting themselves, their position, and their power. No, they wanted to exalt the one who truly is the all-powerful one, and they wanted to worship him. Love wasn't lip service. Love was displayed by their attitudes and their actions. These wise men weren't wishing they kept their gifts or reluctant in giving their gifts. No, they were eager to give Jesus their gifts. Look at verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and they worshiped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. The gold, precious and valuable metal, represented the royalty of Christ. 
appropriate gift for the king of kings. Frankincense was a beautiful smelling incense used only on special occasions, very expensive. Some scholars believe that the aroma of that frankincense symbolized the sinless life of Jesus. Sometimes frankincense was used in grain offerings, sometimes at weddings. One, one scholar suggested that it was the incense of deity sprinkled on certain offerings at the temple to symbolize the people's desire to please the Lord. The myrrh was a valuable spice or perfume. If it was mixed with wine, it was used as an anesthetic. If it was mixed with spices, it was used in preparation for bodies at burial time. So the gold, picturing his royalty, the frankincense, his deity, the myrrh for his humanity. These valuable gifts had purpose, had meaning, and they were given out of heartfelt love and worship for the Savior and King. And God warned the wise men. Look at verse 12. Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Notice also God warned Joseph, verse 13, when they, the wise men, had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. As I already mentioned, I'll say it again. No one can pull the wool over God's eyes. God knows every activity. He knows every secret. Nobody can hide anything from him. No one can hide from him. Herod's scheme was in open view before God, and it backfired on him. The wise men did not return to Herod. Joseph obeyed, took the, his family to Egypt, and he fulfilled what the prophet Hosea wrote about centuries earlier in Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. God called his son out of Egypt. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem in his vicinity who were two years old and younger in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. And then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. That is Jeremiah 31, 15. And it's mentioned in verse 18 of Matthew 2. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning and Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So how do you wrap this up and bring it to an application here? Let me just say that this very day there are varied attitudes towards Jesus which are revealed by people's action. Those three attitudes may be represented right here this morning. Some of you here out in the lobby watching online may just have a fervent love for Christ and just love Him and want to worship Him. There may be some in this group, hopefully not, but there may be some in this group, maybe out in the lobby, maybe watching online, that are just absolutely hostile towards the thought of Jesus Christ and the mention of His name. And there may be some here that are just indifferent. Oh, well, whatever. It's Christmas. It comes and goes. And I'll just keep living my life like I'm living my life and indifferent to Jesus Christ. So what is your attitude towards Jesus? Pharisees were indifferent. They wouldn't travel but six, seven miles. They wouldn't even travel seven miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to see Jesus. We don't find the Pharisees kneeling down and humbly bowing before the Lord and giving gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we certainly don't see them worshiping him. Herod was indignant. He was furious when he found out that he had been outwitted by the Magi. Going through the motions of worship, his motions and his, his little role play was exposed. God exposed it. He was indignant. And the Magi, they were involved in worship to the Lord. They traveled far, searched diligently, were overjoyed when they found Christ. 
They bowed humbly. They gave generously to the king of kings. And they worshiped him. Verse 11, opened their treasures, presented him with gifts of gold, incense, and myrrh. They not only gave their treasures, but tune in on this one. They gave their time. They gave their resources to travel. They gave their effort. It takes effort to live for Christ. They gave their effort. They risked their life to worship the true king of kings and the true Lord of lords. I heard this quote and I wrote it down because it's a really good quote. No price was too high. No sacrifice too great. Have you ever heard that quote before? That one just stuck out in my mind. I wrote it down. No price was too high. No sacrifice too great. What is your attitude towards Christ and what are your actions regarding Jesus? You know, you have a choice today before you leave this place, before you start your new year out, Will you ignore the Lord as the Pharisees did? Or will you be indignant towards Jesus and oppose him as Herod did? If you decide that route, you're in a losing battle. God always wins, okay? Or will you be influenced by the Savior as the wise men were? I choose number three. I've already been influenced by Jesus Christ, but I want to continually be influenced by the Lord every day of my life until I breathe my last. Hey, I want to encourage you today to yield your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior and worship Him. That's the wisest life we can live is to give our life to Jesus Christ. Yes, give your treasures and give your time and give your talents and give your spiritual gifts. Give Jesus your all. Amen? We sang it today. I surrender all, right? I've never sang that song, I surrender a little bit. I surrender one-eighth. I surrender one-half. I surrender three-quarters. No, I surrender all. That's what God wants. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen, those gifts you received at Christmas time. You'll either outgrow them or the, the sweater will come unraveled or you'll decide to wrap it up and re-gift it to somebody else next Christmas uh, or you'll take it to Goodwill and deliver it to them or the well and let them gift it to somebody and it will not bring lasting joy and excitement and satisfaction, but Jesus Christ will. Do you know him? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? If you were to die today, can you answer with absolute certainty, 100% certainty, that if I died, I know I would go to heaven? Can you answer that question today? These things have been written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you can know that you have eternal life. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you trusted him? Not have you trusted in water baptism or have you trusted in communion? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ, the one who died on an old rugged cross and paid for all your sins once and for all and arose again that third day? Have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Those shepherds wisely came and they worshiped Jesus you can't worship the Lord until you know him as your Lord and Savior you can sing songs to him you can read about him hear about him but true worship doesn't happen until you worship the Lord in spirit and in truth you must know him as your Lord and Savior before true worship can happen is there anybody here say this morning, Pastor Dan, if I were to die today, I do not know for sure that I would go to heaven. Now, I know the wise men gave their gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but this morning I want to give Jesus my life. I want him to be my Lord and Savior. I want to give the Lord me. Would you pray for me? And I will pray for you. Anybody here at all like that this morning? Pastor Dan, I would like to invite Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. 
Then believers, let me ask you, as we're getting ready to start 2024, are you willing to give God your treasures, your time, your talents, your spiritual gifts, your all? If that's your heart's desire, would you lift your hand this morning? Pray for me, Pastor Dan, that this, this desire, this goal will be the true reality of my life each and every day. Amen. Father God, I pray that we would be like these wise men, following you wholeheartedly, loving you with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and giving you our very best, God. May we use the life that you have given us for your honor and for your glory. It goes quickly. James said life is a vapor that appears for a little time and then it's gone. So God, help us not to waste the years, the months, the moments, to seize the opportunities to love you and serve you and to give our life for your glory. In Jesus' precious name, Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask the musicians to come on up, and we're going to we're going to close out with a song today as they're coming. A couple of quick things here: uh, no Wednesday night classes until January 10th. Men's Bible study will start back up not tomorrow night, but next Monday, the 8th. And offering envelopes are available in the lobby at the table if you'd like some prayer gatherings on Saturday, January 20th, from 9 to 1. This song has been on my mind uh, just be the last song that we sing in our church service for 2023 and it should be the song in our heart as we get ready to enter into the new year and uh let's all stand together please and we're going to sing together glory in the highest There we go. You got it. You are the first. You go before. You are the last, Lord, you're the encore. Your name to last for all to see. The starry host declares your glory. Oh, 
song on your heart to Jesus Christ. Amen. Bring glory to his name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. You have a great day.